Come on, you guys. All right, is that better? All right. <laughs> Man, we're just starting already. All right, so, do I have to start over or did you hear most of that? Okay. Dr. Sasan Keshavarzi comes to us from the University of Florida, Jacksonville. And there, he was the chief neurosurgeon and head of the neurosurgery program. And he is now a resident here in Bakersfield, and we're just thrilled to have him as our medical director of our Brain and Spine Center here at San Joaquin Community Hospital. So we're just absolutely delighted he's here in the community. And I think that you guys are going to be really, really intrigued by what he's going to present today. And so let's let's get right into it. I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Sasan Keshavarzi. spine surgery and uh, how does it help? How are you? Um, there's a lot of misinformation, bad information. It's really hard to be a patient these days, right? Every doctor tells you something a little bit different. You hear these horror stories <laughs> and, then it's got, and then it kind of sticks with you and then folks go home and they're really in a lot of pain and they're suffering. They're not sure who to listen to. So this is not going to be like spine 101 where everyone's going to walk away, you know, ready to treat some patients, but it's going to be hopefully a way to help you navigate your healthcare and, and the physicians and the folks that are trying to get you some messages about what you need. Let's see if this works. Yeah, so my background, uh, Jimmy covered it. I actually am from California. Most of my life I've lived here. I trained in San Diego and San Francisco. I was the chief of neurosurgery for about three years in Jacksonville. Uh, we had a level one trauma center, a pediatric spine program, all kinds of fun stuff, but I really wanted to come back here. So now, um, let's, now I'm here, and I love talking about spine, and we're going to have to cut this short, probably about 40 minutes, so you folks can ask some questions. I spend my vacations doing spine. This is my global outreach with some of my friends um, doing pediatric missions. And if somebody spends their vacation doing something, you know they really like it. So I'm the guy you have to stop from talking about spine surgery. <laughs> um, this is you know, one of my favorite pictures, one of my favorite moments uh, of one of our outreach projects. I think we were in. Nicaragua, wherever Crystal is. Was that Nicaragua? Yeah, it was Nicaragua, and Crystal travels with us. And the reason I really like this picture is, in some ways, when you do these medical missions, folks get better health care than they do here. Because these guys, there were three, were all spine surgeons. There's two orthopedic surgeons my, and myself. They're both in Texas right now in two different cities. And that's really the way you want your care to be. You want multiple specialists that look at your films and discuss your care and aren't arguing, but they're working together. And I think that's one thing I really enjoy about that. Now, I'm new to Bakersfield, so I'm getting to know some of your pain management docs and your neurologists and learn to work with them. But just my advice in general, you always want to go to a physician who's working with people of other specialties and getting their opinion. There's not one solution that's going to fit everybody. You're going to notice that today. So let's see if this is going to work. Uh-oh. <laughs> Technical difficulties. What, am I hitting the right arrow? Uh-oh. Okay. There we go. So I really love this picture. This is a friend of mine who picked this out. And the reason we picked this out is because it's really hard to tell what's real here. It's a nice little optical illusion, right? And then when you look behind the scene, it's pretty amazing. So it's the same thing when it comes to healthcare, I think. Uh, there's so much information and advertisement out there right now that you have these different institutes from around the country that are bombarding you with advertisement. They're talking about different incision sizes. They're talking about Band-Aid incisions. Not really sure what they're advertising in this spine case. Um, and then, you want me to go back? I think he's had too much water. So, one of my favorite things is this image here. Even though I'm probably the only surgeon in the room, can we all agree that we're probably not going to accomplish the same thing with that incision that we're accomplishing with this incision? Two different surgeries. They're both great surgeries. You might need one. You might need the other. Um, they both can be very successful surgeries, but it's a little bit false advertisement if they're trying to convince you that they're going to accomplish with this incision what this surgeon's doing over here. I do both surgeries. I offer one to one patient, the other to the other patient. So, I'm sorry? I'm glad I finished lunch. That's oh, I'm sorry, that's true. If anyone, <laughs> that's the root, I apologize. That's a good point. It doesn't bother me, so I've gotten used to it. I know, it's my fault. 
So let's talk about academic uh, spine surgery, back pain. What have we done to try to clear all this up a little bit? I think the last 15 years has been really, really amazing for spine surgery. That's why there's so many spine surgeons out there and so much advertisement. We have literally tried to break it down to its very basic elements. So what people have done is take, we take people that are completely asymptomatic, normal people, we put them on pressure waves, these pressure plates, we get x-rays, we measure their forces, we measure their every parameter you can think of. The big new thing is the pelvis that everyone's paying attention to. Every, and then we look at their ages, you'll see up here, these are people in their 20s to 40s, 40s to 60s. How does a normal person's spine evolve? It's really not this mysterious thing anymore where surgeons and doctors might kind of wave their hands and hope that patients don't pick up on the details. We've really, really clarified a lot of the statistics, uh, as the relevant parameters that are gonna affect your health. So we're trying to figure out what we can do to make you happier and live your life more comfortably, okay? And then we've literally looked at all these different parameters and sent them through all kinds of statistical analysis. This has been about 15 years, very aggressive, big groups across the country. And the biggest thing is a very simple concept, which is you have five minutes <laughs> to finish this talk. That's the concept. Now, the big thing is balance. You know, and, and when we look at patients, it always comes down to that. But what's really neat is not, you know, when folks come outside of what we call the cone of economy. So if a human being comes out of balance, they start hurting other parts of their bodies, knees, joints. That's why when I see patients in my office, it's not uncommon they've had their hips done, or they've had their knees done, or they've had their shoulders done, or they've had their neck done. So this all works together. And what ends up happening is now we're asking the questions, how does the balance affect your walking? So you, you guys are probably used to folks talking to you about pain. And it's really hard sometimes to win the battle with back pain or leg pain. Um, but we have to prioritize. The bigger thing to talk about is function. A lot of people aren't functioning. A lot of folks tell me, yeah, I'm doing great. I mean, I just have to make a couple of adjustments. They sit in my office. And I'm like, what are those adjustments? They're like, well, I have to wait till 3.30 when my daughter gets off work so she can come home and help me with these things. And then on Saturdays, I can't do these things, but if I don't do them, I feel okay. And I'm retired, but I can't golf. And I love to fish, but when I get on that boat and it keeps bouncing, I have a lot of back pain. These aren't really adjustments. I, I think uh, this is a quality of life issue. So that's what we're looking at. This is what we have found. This is the nice cartoon that explains what happens to people as they get older. As they get older, they keep bending forward, and they keep bending forward, and they have that balance issue. We've all seen those elderly people in Walmart with the little walkers that are trying to get ahead. That's like the extreme version of where everybody's headed. As people get older, if you give us all enough time, we're gonna end up there. But what happens is they start bending back and rotating their body to adjust for it. Then they stop putting their stress on their knees. They start putting their stress on their hips. They start putting stress other places. So I have folks that come to me and say, you know, I've always had back pain, but now it's so much worse as I'm getting older. Why is it affecting me so much more? Well, because you used to put all the stress on the other joints, and now they're failing, and so your problem's becoming a more significant problem. So we have to, when we talk about spine surgery, there's not one bullet. There's not like a magic bullet that's gonna cure everybody. You gotta look at every single patient and come up with a plan for them. And that's when you involve other specialists, whether it's chiropractors or neurologists or other surgeons. So the question that always should be asked is, what's the right answer for me or for you? For example, where is your pain coming from? I can't tell you how many people come to me for back surgery and it turns out to be their hips. I just walk them. And if you simply get, I mean, if you just get the patient to stand up and walk, you can see they're limping. That's gonna be a hip patient, so I send them to a hip surgeon. I'm not gonna do back surgery, that's not gonna get better. I've been in Bakersfield for three months. I've had three patients come to me who've had back surgery and it didn't get any better. <clears throat> so I send them to the hip doctor because there are problems in their hips. I have people come to me with neck issues and they're worried that there's a nerve you know, squeezing on that nerve that's causing that arm pain. It's actually a shoulder issue. I examine their shoulders and I send them to a shoulder surgeon. They don't need neck surgery. So the first thing is to clarify what is the source of your pain? Then the next question is, what's the right thing for you? Should we, should we be recommending pain management, whether it's an implant, whether it's an injection? For some people, that's the right answer. For some people, the right answer is weight loss or whether they're gonna do core strengthening exercises. Some people have failed those. Certainly when it's really, when you have a lot of back pain and you can barely get out of bed, when somebody tells you to go lose 20 pounds, how are you gonna do that? So it really comes down to looking at all the different treatments out there and really temporizing the treatment to the patient. Now, one of the big myths out there, I think, is that surgery is your very last option. It's not always your very last option. Sometimes it should be your very last option, right? So like this gentleman that I made, it's a joke. He's on a treadmill. People come to me and they tell me after about three hours on a treadmill, they have back pain. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to say don't go on a treadmill. 
But I, we can all agree we shouldn't be rushing to the operating room because if, if you're on a treadmill for three hours. I, I, you know, especially being a surgeon, we'll do these medical missions in Central and South America. The other surgeons will bring their wives. There's one in particular. She came to me in Costa Rica and she said, yeah, I really need surgery. I want it done minimally invasively. We want to keep the host company ha country happy. But her problem was she was on a treadmill. After about 45 minutes, she had back pain. This is not a person who needs surgery. But then there's the other gentleman here in a wheelchair. That seems like an extreme response. I had a, when I was at University of Florida, I had a patient that was referred to me, and she had horrible, horrible tightness around her spinal cord. She was maybe 40 years old. And the other surgeons had tried managing her conservatively, and I said, you really should have surgery. About a week later, she got admitted to the hospital, and I went to see her because she was paralyzed. And I said to her, I, sa I said, you really should have surgery. <laughs> She said, I'm scared of surgery, and I didn't mean to make light of it, but I was like, at this point, what do you have to lose, yeah. right? So I did what a good doctor would do. She was too stubborn, so I called all her sisters, <laughs> and I brought them all in on Saturday. We did the surgery on Sunday, and she was the baby of the family, even though she was 40. There was a lot of uh, more uh, aggressive personalities in the room. <laughs> so the sisters convinced her. She had surgery, and she walked out of the hospital a week later perfectly fine. <laughs> So it, it, it's, sometimes it's the last option, sometimes it's the first option. And who's going to help you figure that out is going to be your physician or your surgeon that you feel comfortable with. So then it comes down to, should I have open surgery or minimally invasive surgery? You know, there's that laser spine institute. I've seen that Band-Aid out there. They do these miracle things. And, and the guy is getting up now and playing with the dog. And before, he couldn't play with the dog. And I want to play with my dog. And, <laughs> And so here's, let me explain something. You can't, you know, this morning I had a phone call from a group in Los Angeles asking me to teach a class for them. They said, can you teach us how to do this surgery minimally invasively? And I said, listen, I've done a lot of those. Nobody's going to do this surgery minimally invasively. And, and so I trained originally on minimally invasive spine surgery. I did my fellowship in complex open spine surgery. I do both. It's a matter of picking the right patient for the right surgery, okay? And asking the question, what really is even in, in our world, in academics, we cannot decide what's really minimally invasive, what's not. How do you define that? It sounds great, and patients love the sound of it. If you want to take this disc out minimally invasively over here, not a big problem. If you want to correct this horrible situation over here, good luck. And when your surgeon says he can do it, you might want to ask, well, how many of these have you done minimally invasively that, that work so well? So let's talk about technology. This is the one that I was showing you. If you want to take that disc out through this little incision, I can do it all day long, no problem, and it's not a really a big deal. Here's the caveat, though. Here's the incision when you make it minimally invasively, and here's the incision when you do it open. You know what I'm saying? But we can do it. I can put retractors down and x-rays, and it's not a big deal. It's a great surgery, but it works well either way, okay? Um, this, some people think, is considered minimally invasive. I think anytime you have a big spike-looking thing like that coming towards your body, I'm not sure it's minimally invasive anymore, OK? The reason they call it minimally invasive is because the skin incision is smaller, OK? Some people even open the skin, and then they don't split the fascia, and they consider that minimally invasive. Some people think this is minimally invasive. Can we all agree this doesn't look minimally invasive to you? <laughs> this is a great surgery. This patient's going to do fantastic. Okay, but is it really minimally invasive? Some people would, you see how the skin is open? Are you okay? <laughs> Some people don't open that skin. Some people do open that skin, okay? So let's talk about, and having said that, minimally invasive surgery and technology is fantastic. It's gonna keep growing and growing and it's gonna become better and better. Um, here's a great surgery that we describe as minimal. This was actually come out of San Diego where I trained, so I got a lot of experience with it. This is an approach where you come through the side of the patient, make a small incision on the side about the size of my finger, and you can operate at multiple levels. You're behind the bowel, and patients do great. It's a great surgery. But let me ask you, by the time you put all those implants in, see, these are all implants at these every level. If, so what matters more, how, many, how much hardware you have or how big the incision is, right? What about the risk? If I go through the back and I make an incision, the only thing in the way are muscles. If I go through the side, there's blood vessels, there's bowel, there's all kinds of major structures you don't want to get into. So those decisions, I do both surgeries, and they can both be fantastic for the right patient. I'll, in fact, I'll show you one that had this surgeon did really well. But you want to go to a doctor that has all these different tools available to them and can adjust the surgery to you. So this is how that surgery works. You go from the side. We monitor your spine, your nerve roots, and everything. Here's a gentleman that came to me who had like six or seven prior surgeries. And you got to be careful when you start having six or seven surgeries because you're going to fall into this category where other surgeons don't want to touch you, right? 
this is a really tough situation to get into. This gentleman was probably 280, 300 pounds. He was also had a very, very unpleasant wife, and he himself was not very pleasant, and they were justified. They had been to three prior surgeons who had kept moving him along until they got to me. And this is before I left Florida, about three months before, so I was super busy. But he was a very, you know, unhappy guy. And, and as a surgeon, you're sitting there thinking, do I really want to bring this guy into my life, <laughs> right? And then his wife isn't very nice either. And you're like, God, do I really want to bring this entire family into my life? <laughs> and so he was, he had, and this is the truth. This is, he had six or seven prior surgeries. He was miserable. And what you can notice here is that he has that slip. He's had this prior fusion. He used to have screws down here. They took the screws out. Then they put some back in. And you just mince meat by the time they're done. And you can see that big slip right there. So this, you see that big hole right there? That's where the nerves are supposed to come out of. That hole is completely crushing that nerve root. So he's got a lot of leg pain. He's got that slip right there that's hurting his back. So right over here is the slip. And that's where the nerve root's kind of getting squeezed. So I took him to the operating room. He's about 300 pounds. He's perfect for minimally invasive surgery because now I don't have to do all that tissue dissection. Made a small incision on the side, exactly the technology I just showed you. We put this big graft in here, nice big giant graft in here, and I opened up that hole so his leg felt fantastic. But the, when it came to the back portion of the surgery, I had to open him up. I did a traditional open surgery, moved those screws up top, and he was already fused, so I didn't have to put any hardware down there. He did fantastic. In fact, his wife came to me um, after surgery, and she sounded kind of upset, which kind of got me guarded. And she said, you know, physical therapy came in here and they demanded my husband get out of bed today. Like, and then he did. I love you. <laughs> it's like, whew. That could have gone in a lot of different ways, right? So she was actually super happy, and he did a nice little, you, if you go to like vitals.com or some of those websites, you'll see he, did, he, did, he wrote a nice little um, vignette. But, uh, but you know what I did tell him is, I said, look, you're 280 pounds. This is going to help you for the next three to four years, but this is going to keep happening to you. You need to, now that I helped you with your back pain and your leg pain, it's time to lose some weight, it's time to do some swimming, it's time to do some Pilates or do some yoga, whatever you and your wife do, that's gonna keep you happy, you know what I mean? And hopefully he's doing that, but he's much happier. And, and trust me when I tell you, as you consider surgery, by the time you're on your sixth or seventh surgery, the number of surgeons that wanna get into your life really goes down. So let's talk about, so that was minimally invasive. Let's talk about open surgery. This is a young lady, she was in the Navy and they were gonna kick her out because she couldn't, um, she was an MP and she couldn't participate. She has a very small curve, very small scoliosis. I mean, that's like barely a scoliotic curve. Curve magnitude, how bad it is, doesn't correlate with the amount of back pain. I took her to the OR because she didn't wanna get kicked out of the Navy. I fused her, she did very well. In fact, she did so well, she dropped out of the Navy. And she's, uh, I don't know what she's doing now, but she's super happy. She came to my clinic. I wasn't expecting this. She came to my clinic a few weeks later and said, I, didn't, I never thought I could live pain free. So people do really well with these surgeries. Let's see, here's another young lady who came to me. I'll show you her video. This was a very interesting case. In case you're not, you know, haven't seen a lot of these x-rays, look at how many surgeries she's had. She has an implant device that was pl placed by somebody, dorsal column stimulator that's right there. She has a pain pump right there. She's had cement injected into this bone. She's had multiple fusions here and then had the hardware removed. Okay, and she's miserable and she's only like 50 years old, she's single and walking around like that makes it really hard to uh, socialize, right? Yeah. So she came and I had to do a huge surgery on her. That's an open surgery, big giant open surgery but she went from looking like she's always bowing down to completely walking straight and she's very happy even though it's a huge surgery because that was the right surgery for her. So this is what the end result of what she looked like. <coughs> Can you um, hit this button on the play button for this? So here she is. I, I've taken out the top so you can't see their faces, but, oh, you went too far. Go, come on back. I think there's a play button on the video on the left. They both should have little play buttons. Can you see it or no? There we go. Okay. There. So you can see. Can you rewind first? Actually, pause it first. Just rewind for a second. I want to point something out. Just take it all the way back. Keep, oh, stop right there. You see this right here? This is a walker. So if you're... One of the, I, I really think it's important that every spine surgeon or doctor is going to treat you, walks you at least once during that office visit. So I want you to notice this lady's only like, look at the way she's standing, the way she's bending those knees, the way she's bent forward, and she has to have a walk or typically to walk. At a minimum, we can appreciate in the next x-ray there's no walk, in the next, there's no walker anymore. This is like three weeks after surgery. Go ahead and play that. And you'll see, um, no, no, the first one. Okay, well, this is the after. She looks great. The, the before, though, take a look at how she walks. She's a little nervous. 
Uh, that's why I took the volume off. <laughs> so she's going to, um, but watch how she stands. At the, that's my ortho resident who's never going to go into spine surgery. He hates it. Um, he was my, on my rotation. But as she, watch how she stands. She's going to stand exactly how we were discussing. She has to bend those hips and the knees, and then she's going to bend back to completely back. That's how she's comfortable. By the time she's done standing like that, it's really hard to walk long distances without that walker, and she's wearing out those joints. Can you play the next video, please? Now she's had a surgery. I think this is probably five or six weeks after surgery. The walker's gone. It's walking up nice and straight, and she's much happier. Right? Okay. Uh, that's a good question. So most of the, she never had bending in her back because most of your bending in your back happens down here and the prior surgeons had already fused it. Very little of your bending happens in your thoracic spine, in your chest area. So that's why uh, we try to stay out of that lumbar spine as much as we can when we do these big surgeries. But the more important question is, um, a lot of times patients come to me after surgery and they, can, they feel like they can bend more. And the reason is they're so guarded like especially with people with neck pain, they're so guarded all the time. They're so worried about the pain. They're not really moving. They're not really bending. So let's go to the next video. So here's a young, this is a lady who came to me, and this CT scan looked great. Doesn't look that bad, looks pretty normal. But when you stood her up, you can appreciate she, some people say she looks like a duck. That's her spine right there. That's her pelvis right there. So she's completely slips forward three or four segments. And this is what she looks like. She literally, first of all, she's had open heart surgery. And she has this horrible stance where she looks, for lack of a better word, like a duck. So we took her, and she had to have a huge surgery, but now she stands up perfectly straight. She had to have the front and the back. That's a very aggressive surgery, but that's the only way she was going to get better. So it just really depends. Yeah, I'm not going to say have big surgeries. I'm not going to say have little surgeries. I'm going to say talk to a surgeon you feel comfortable with, someone who has all these different skill sets, and have them explain to you. So here she is how she stood before surgery, and that's how she stands now. So she was super happy. She came back to my clinic. All the women in my office were crying for her, and they were all like gathering around. It was pretty dramatic. So then there's some other things. So back pain can be caused for a lot of reasons. So here's a gentleman who had a can't, he had tumor pushing on his spinal cord. The reason I show some of these films is because I know there's a lot of people out there that think spine surgery doesn't work. So it's nice to see some success stories where that you realize it does work if it's in the right situation. So here's, the, can you play this please? This is a gentleman who had renal cell carcinoma, has cancer pushing on his spinal cord. We've deleted the volume, but what you'll appreciate, he's not gonna be able to move that right side of his body. He's completely paralyzed on the right side up to his arms. And he has a catheter over here because he can't void on his own. So we take him to the operating room and we do a big surgery, front, back, Saturday and Tuesday. He was, uh, he lost a lot of blood. It's a very bloody tumor. He was taking, I think he was taking 10 to 20 tablets of aspirin a day. And he never told me that till two years. Oh till two years later because he had so much neck pain. But what choice did I have? We had to go to surgery. We did his surgery. Here he is. Can you play that, please? This is the same week he had his surgery. And that leg that was paralyzed, within a few days, he's walking. Thank you for that. I appreciate that response. Let's go to the next video. You can't hear the volume, but I keep encouraging him not to use the walker, but he, he felt he needed it. But then here he is now. Can you play that, please? He's a really, really sweet guy. Like everybody loves, um, loved him. And now he's walking without a walker. This is about six weeks after surgery. Wow. And he's doing great. Yay, thank you for the clap. One person. <laughs> thank you. All right, so here's the deal. I didn't save his life. He has about a three year life expectancy that the oncologist gave him. But during those three years, he doesn't have to sit in a wheelchair. He can control his bowels and bladder and we're really trying to protect his dignity. And he did great. And then the, some of the tumor came back, but we kind of radiated it, and the rest of it went great. Here's a 17-year-old that came to me, and he was that awkward 17-year-old that had that big bend. He's about a 90-degree bend. He's kind of hunched over in high school, and it didn't really bother him. His mom was super nervous about, he, she, he'd been to six or seven other surgeons, and they decided to have me do their surgery because I just sat down and said, here's how we're going to monitor your spinal cord. Here's how we're going to make sure your nerves don't get damaged. And we kind of spent some time together. And what was really interesting is I was worried about his lung function, because by the time you get these curves in teenagers, they can start having co collapsing their lungs. They can't take big breaths. He was a musician, wanted to be a school teacher, to be, teach music. And so that's what I was thinking about. The first day I, I rounded on him after his surgery, and he's a teenager, he's 17, and we all know that 
you know, they don't handle pain and suffering very well sometimes, right? They're not very stoic. So you round on him, and you're like, oh, what's he gonna say? Mom was awesome, mom was fantastic, he had a great mom. And he said something very interesting. I wasn't even expecting it. He said, I didn't realize how easy it is to swallow because he'd been getting food kinked in there for his entire life, and for about five or 10 years. So he was super happy, and he was taller, and he went to school and bragged to his friends and showed them their scar. Um, and then he had this, now this is a big operation, but this operation, if you do a lot of these surgeries, took about, I don't think it took more than four hours. He was in the ICU for a night or two. He might get a little bit of blood, but now he's living, you know, and if you go on the web, you'll see he's written a nice review about getting his life back. And he wants to be a school teacher for music, and he plays the, the tuba or the trombone or something. Well, I, I don't play an instrument, so I was impressed. So he was happy. Um, this is a case we did at San Joaquin. Patient comes to the emergency room. So these are all big surgeries. Let's talk about a little surgery that makes an incredible amount of difference. Patient comes to San Joaquin um, and had had a few, been, been getting weaker for about two weeks and discharged from another hospital. I don't know which one and I don't know where it was. That's not the point. Um, and he, all he had was this little disc right here pushing on his spinal cord. And then watch what, can you play this? So watch how he's, his, um, we've killed the volume, but I'm asking him to move his legs and arms. And this is right here across the street. So nothing's happening. Now he's gonna move his hands a little bit. That's it. There we go. So we take him to surgery, do a very small surgery. You'll see his incision site, maybe. We tried to block him out. About take, this surgery takes about an hour, hour and 20 minutes. And right here up on, up, up on his neck. Can you play this video, please? You can see his scars right here. This is the next day after surgery. Good crowd. <laughs> so his legs are working. Great. Now he's so happy he never came back to see me. If he's out there, I'm just saying you might want to come back and at least say hi. Or maybe bring me a sandwich. I deserve a sandwich or something. What do you think? Are you with me? Thank you. Thank you. All right, so the next the, the big question is when do you need to see a surgeon? First of all, surgeons aren't evil. They're not trying to trick you. Oh, maybe they are. I'm not going to talk for all surgeons. <laughs> Let's step back. We're not try I'm not trying to trick you into anything. In fact, you know, most people will tell you that it takes a long time for me. And if by the time I do those big surgeries, I have to meet your wife. I have to meet your husband or your kid or whoever's going to show up. You know, that's two or three. The smaller surgeries, it's also nice to meet your family so they know they're going to take care of you and we can talk about what's going to happen. But I like happy patients. So when should you see a surgeon for sure? A, you should always go, go if you just want to know what your surgical options are. You want someone to tell you, should I get steroid injections? Should I get physical therapy? What do you think about chiropractors? That's a very fair conversation to have with a surgeon. The next, but the arm pain, leg pain, by the way, responds a lot better to surgery than back pain and neck pain. By the time you have arm pain and neck pain, something is squeezing on those nerves, and hopefully we can make that much better. Um, when, I always tell my patients, if you have pain and you want to tolerate it, I'm not going to push you. You have a little bit of pain going down your arms, you really should start thinking about surgery, but I'm not going to push you. If you start getting weakness, I'm going to push you. And if your spinal cord is at stake, I'm really going to push you, because all those things can't be reversed. I'm not going to like assault you, but I'm going to push you a little bit. Um, so by the time you're getting weakness, if you have any changes in your bowel or bladder habits, that's actually a medical emergency. So let's say you're doing perfectly fine and now it's like 8 o'clock at night and you've ruptured a disc and now you, you have urinary retention or you have incontinence, you can't move your legs. That's something that needs to be operated on within a day, maybe two days. Usually it's a two-day medical emergency. If, and if we get you to the operating room, it's actually my first surgery out of training. I could do all these fancy things and I ended up doing a discectomy on a Friday at like 2 in the morning and uh, she got all her function back. So it, that's, sometimes, that's, that's something you really want to just either go to the emergency room or call a doctor. The big thing also is spinal cord and the neck. We always talk about the back. Let's talk about your spinal cord. If you're dropping objects, pens, your handwriting is going bad, you're dropping mugs, 
you might be having some trouble with your spinal cord. A lot of people think you're having a stroke. I get consults all the time where they're like, hey, I think this lady's having a stroke, this gentleman's having a stroke, can you come take a look at him? Then you get an MRI and they have a big disc in their, in their cervical spine. So if you're dropping objects, handwriting is going bad, you're in the shower, the water's in your eye, you're having balance issues, and you, when you close your eyes because the water's in there, you feel off kilt. When you're trying to you know, walk up a set of stairs, you always have to hang on to that railing. These are all signs that you might be having issues with your spinal cord. And then really, this, if you are having those issues, then it's a surgical issue. There's really nothing else that's gonna fix it. And as it gets worse and worse and worse, it's not reversible, okay? So we think we've talked about most of these things. Um, let's see, now the next question is, I don't even know where we're going with this. Oh, neurosurgeons, this is one of the questions people always ask, orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, chiropractors, so on and so forth. Really, the field is becoming one. I think in about the next five or 10 years, training, there are programs right now. I train in a program where I work with both orthopedics and neurosurgeons. When I do my trips uh, for pediatrics, they're all orthopedic surgeons. The world is really changing. It's no longer like, like 30 years ago, it was very specific guidelines who did what. Uh, there's really, at this time, there's actually nothing a neurosurgeon can't do with your spine. Um, the big push now is for neurosurgeons getting into more pediatrics. But for the adult population, they do everything you would possibly need, whether it's hardware, scoliosis, whatnot. Oh, referrals, that's me. That's the same tie, uh, don't judge me. Um, <laughs> so those are our referral pads that what we try to do is when, we refer, when patients get referrals, it just makes your life a little bit easier. Just realize when you go to a doctor, until he, see, he or she sees you, he can't order an MRI. So just not to waste your time, you might ask your physicians, your referring physicians, hey, do I need an MRI? Because if you don't have it, I, I can't get it until I see you. And that's my website. The nice thing about the website, by the way, is I don't have a relationship with any of the companies on that website, but there's tons of educational material. So there's a lot of videos that explain what is like, you know, these different conditions you might have heard. Or when you, when you open up your MRI, this is a common thing. People come to my office and they're like, hey, what does this word mean? Or what is the surgery? There's the, I have all kinds of videos on all the surgeries. There are animations that describe what the surgery is. So it's a good resource for education. I think I made my clock. That's awesome. Yeah? Perfect. Yes, ma'am. Um, do you have a top age, let's say, that you will not do spinal surgery on older people at a certain age? You just right. say you don't want to go in there, the tissues are not that good anymore? Well, it really depends on the situation. But probably the oldest person I've operated on is, I think he was 94. 84 but that was a trauma he had a broken back and he was doing great and we tried not to operate on him we but every time we tried to sit him up his spine would go wacky and he needed to have surgery so we did it but for an elective person I really try to stay out of people like in their 80s and 85 but I've done it if something is really important if some if, if there's a way to avoid it it really depends on your 80, 85 year old though. Let's say they've had three heart attacks and a history of cancer and multiple issues then you, or strokes, then you're gonna say, hey, maybe we should try some other treatments. And it also depends on the surgery they need. Let's say it's a quick surgery and it's gonna take half an hour versus, I mean, I'm not gonna take a, someone that's had multiple medical issues for a long time and do like a seven hour surgery. So again, it's a very good question, but it depends on the circumstances. What I can tell you is even with some traumas, a lot of us don't even treat people at a certain age because the bone is never gonna heal. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Why do, why do the epidurals not work? Yeah. Oh, you're trying to get me in trouble with everybody now. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, think um, I don't do epidurals. Epidurals have a couple of, okay, so when you get injections, let's talk about what's, the, what's good about injections. Let's start there. Ed injections can be therapeutic. Most, most people are using them for therapy. So you go to a doctor, he does an injection so that your symptoms get relieved. But keep in mind, and sometimes they work for like a, some people they say, hey, it works. Some people say it works sometimes, it doesn't work all the time. Some people say it never worked for me. And the doctor is trying to figure out what category you're gonna fall into. And the rationale there is, it's not a very invasive procedure. It doesn't take a lot of time, doesn't require hospitalization. If someone is a little bit elderly and they're not very healthy, this is not a bad way to keep them out of the operating room table. So that's one option. And, every, and I gotta be honest, I think depending on your pain management physician, they have different criteria for when they use epidurals. Um, and so it's, it's, it's definitely something that is open to interpretation. 
things. Um, but the other nice thing about epidurals is diagnostics. I use them for diagnostic purposes. So somebody comes to me and they have three or four bad levels, and I don't know which one's the worst, where should I operate, I'll send them for an epidural. Even if it helps for 24 hours, I know that's the culprit. I know that's where I need to do my surgery. That's the spot. So, and there's, there has been one or two people that have come to me, and it's actually interesting, right? Because patients fall into these extremes where they don't want surgery or they have to have surgery sometimes, you know? And some patients get really upset if you tell them, I don't see anything on your MRI I can treat. Um, I remember a few patients I've had where I sent them for the epidural because it looks perfect. I'm like, I feel guilty. I'm not going to take you to the OR. It's not the right thing. Then the epidural makes them feel fantastic, like that joint was the culprit. So then what I do is I'll go fuse just that one joint and then they're happy. I'm using it to help me figure out what is it I'm not seeing? What is it that's not clear to me? So it can also be not just a therapeutic, but a diagnostic tool. And then another thing is burning some of the nerves. I forget what it's called. Ablations. Ablation. Yeah. Okay. So people do the ablations. Um, so what happens is if you have these, these joints in the back that hurt, and there's an, in order for something to hurt, a nerve has to feed it. If there's no nerve feeding it, it's not gonna hurt. So when I do my surgery, when I'm fusing a segment, that joint's not gonna bother you anymore because by the time I'm done, I've destroyed it. And, and I've cooked it and I've drilled it and all the other stuff that's gonna make him throw up. But the point is, <laughs> and then you sit in the middle of the whole room. I mean, come on. So don't you don't wanna miss anything. No, no bloody details. So, um, so people do the ablations, and again, this is something that is very uh, operator dependent. Every surge, every person who does it is a little bit different, and um, it's very patient specific. I can't tell you who's going to do well with it and who's I've not. Had it and it didn't help. Mm. How many people have had epidural injections? How many people did it not help? So it's like didn't help. All right, so, so we got 50-50. Yeah, again, you can, uh, it's, it's, I have to go to this, this wonderful lady. Give me one second, because she, it's a sciatica question, right? Yes. What were you asking, sorry? Just talk about sciatica, what do you do for that? Yeah, so it depends. Again, um, so people say I have sciatica. Right. Um, so first of all, almost nobody has sciatica. It's usually, there's a nerve root somewhere that leads to the sciatic nerve. It's starting in your back, and it's going to your sciatic nerve, and it's feeding that nerve. And we have to figure out which one of those nerves is giving your sci sciatica. So when you come to my clinic, I always ask people, where's the pain going? Is it going to the top of your foot, the bottom of your foot, the side of your foot? I'm trying to figure out which of the nerves that's feeding that sciatic nerve is going to cause your problems. Then we look at your MRI. You might have a little disc. A disc might be po uh, pooched out and touching it, so we just go take that disc off. You m or it might be the hole that the nerve is coming out, and there's a lot of ligaments there that have gotten fatter or the joint's gotten fatter, so we'll go drill that out. Um, some people have a slip, just like that other gentleman. They have a slip and it's crunching the nerve and it's getting squeezed. So then we'll, do a, we'll straighten out their spine and take the pressure off of that. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons you can have it. The good news is, as I said, leg pain responds a lot better to surgery than back pain does. Yes, ma'am. Meaning what? The head? Meaning I need, I have a hip replacement, I have a nerve on the left, need two knee replacements and two bone screws. Is this all in your future? Or how I <laughs> have a stroke three months ago. That sounds like a lot. And then my mammogram didn't turn out too well. That sounds terrible. Oh, um, he's still here. Well, that's amazing, right, guys? <laughs> I think, you know, by the time you leave here, you might get a few hugs. <laughs> Not me, but I'm not getting any hugs by the time. The blood and gore I showed, but um, it, you know, I think that's a really good question. And I, and I temporize, sometimes we have to go in order of the surgeries. You know, I had a. I can't sit for very long. Right. Yeah, I can't bend them. And I, when I'm home, when I watch TV, I'm in the bedroom. Right. I can't sit. Right. I have a great deal of pain that don't take anything. Right. Nothing. No, I understand. And so a lot of time when you're in pain, I'm going to be honest that hopefully your MRI shows something and it's. Here's the culprit, and we can go in there and fix it. That's not always the case. And I have patients that come to my office, and they can't sit. They have to stand. They have to all kinds of positions. I had a gentleman who came to me this week, and he needs surgery. He has really bad. He has, his cancer has spread to his spine. But he needs to get chemo. So we're going to postpone his surgery for a few months until he gets his chemotherapy. Then we're going to take out the cancer in his spine. I have a gentleman who came to me who needed back surgery, but he has an infected foot. So he has to go get that operated on. Sometimes we have to prioritize. Um, what's actually the most important thing to the patient's health. And usually to make that decision, I have to get on the phone. <clears throat> I have to talk to the oncologist, to the other surgeon, and kind of give you that, um, 
that perfect situation where all the doctors are taking the time to talk about you. Um, so it, it is a tough situation and it requires a lot of conversation because certainly when you're on chemo or you're recovering from an infection or you have to have multiple other surgeries, it's not the time sometimes to have an elective surgery. If you just had a heart attack, um, we just have to temporize that and hope that maybe an epidural will save the day, maybe pain management, maybe something is going to help. I just want to add yes, ma'am. Now I ask you what I do. What do you do? I'm a caregiver. Okay. Oh, uh, wonderful. Ma'am. Okay, question. Um, someone that they say has arthritis and degenerative disc, is there a surgical? Right. So you know, that's a perfect question. I get a lot of those questions. People come and on the MRI report, it says degenerative disc disease. Degenerative disc disease um, doesn't mean a whole lot to me because to be honest, I, I bet if we MRI'd everyone in this room, I bet you if everybody in this room got an MRI, they would all have degenerative disc disease. Has anyone ever seen an MRI report with degenerative disc disease on it in the room? You have one? You have one too? You have one too? Anybody over here? Okay, so we are the club. We're the degenerative disc disease club. I, to me, it's like saying I have degenerative hair disease. Do you know what I'm saying? Got it. Thank you very much. Um, and so we're not going to actually treat this. I mean, no one has, you know, it's like the holy grail of spine surgery. A lot of your pathology, a lot of your problems start in the disc, and the disc gets worse, so you put a lot of stress on your joints, and then everything kind of deteriorates. We don't have a great disc replacement. Um, artificial discs have been around for a long time, but they're not going to help in these circumstances, especially when your joints are hurting in the back. Uh, and so what I would say is when you get that diagnosis, I kind of say, okay, that's true. This patient's older and they have dried up discs and, and so forth. But let's look at what's, what's that causing, okay? Is that causing a slip? Is that causing a nerve impingement? Then we treat that because there's no way, it's, you know, it's not like heart disease where we lower your cholesterol and the heart disease goes away. We actually just treat the symptoms of that, patho that problem because there's no treatment. There's not like a medication. If people are studying it and they're going to give you like chondroitin or some kind of medication for, you know, for arthritis, but to my knowledge, at this time, there's not something specifically for degenerative disc disease. Yes, ma'am. I did have back surgery. I had a heart defect uh -huh. about three years ago. Right. Um, you guys were wonderful. I knew the minute I woke up from surgery, I was better. Can I get on a teeter machine, and does that help do those tractions? Your neck, those things that stretch you. Right. You that's a great question. So let's go back to what you had. So she had a PARS defect. That's when there's a piece of bone missing and people get these slips. Um, that's why I say you really just got to talk to a doctor. People with PARS defects and have slips do really, really well with a fusion. Okay. Even if you don't correct the slip, you know, that's kind of controversial. Some doctors like to correct it. I personally don't like to correct it unless I have to. I didn't have an option. Right. So, and a lot of people have congenital PARS defects. They've had them their whole life. And so the point is that patient's gonna do really, really well with surgery. If somebody doesn't have any of those things, some, and all they have is some dark disc or degenerative disc disease, a lot of times those people don't do very well with surgery. But you have to sit there and make that decision. Um, in terms of traction, before I go to the, I think, I never um, prescribe traction. I know a lot of people get traction. You can go to CVS or Rite Aid and they have traction devices. If it works for you, then that's great. Um, all, the only thing I would recommend is if you're having any neurological symptoms, to get an MRI first and make sure there's not something more profound there you need to address. Because a lot of times we treat the pain, but pain is the body's way of saying something is wrong. So um, abdominal pain, you know, you're not going to ignore it and then end up with a perforation, you know what I mean? If, if it's out, outside the ordinary, if it stays for a long time, if you have, you're going to follow up on that. So I think traction is not a bad idea. Just keep in mind that you might want to get an MRI and have a doctor look at it, especially if you're having shooting arm pain, any balance issues, things like that. What about the teeter machine? Oh, you're talking about people. Okay, so how does that work? You're talking about the, it's not a teeter you machine. What do they call it? Down. You hang upside down. I forgot the name for it. You know, I have friends of mine who need surgery who brag to me. They avoid coming to me because they have that. Some people love it. I think it's great. Essentially, all you're doing is taking your body's weight off the spine and giving it a bit break for a while. And some people love it. He loves it. You know what? No, it doesn't work all the time, but I'll tell you what. It, uh, like this morning, yeah. I was hurting. And you're better. And I got up and I hung upside down for four or five minutes. <laughs> Sit back up and I was going good. Now, what happens if you're hanging upside down and you can't get back up? And I don't raise hell. <laughs> I don't yell and scream until she gets up. Cause, and right, so if your wife has a couple of drinks or something the night before and she's not waking up for you, I mean, that could be a dangerous situation, right? Because now you're upside down.
And then make sure you give your doctor your insurance card for that advice. <laughs> Do you have a name for it? Yeah. Is it a surgery or is it a device you buy? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look at it. I'd have to look at it because I'm not sure which one. I'm sorry? I have not, but I can look it up. Yeah. Yes, sir. Kind of like a double question. Double question. <coughs> I've got Kaiser, and a lot of people have different insurance. As far as you know, you see commercials going to this hospital, go to that. You kind of held hostage by your insurance plan. All right. So you go see your GP, and he says, you know, you go to this pain specialist. You don't really have options of going outside of the system unless it's somebody, you know, like <coughs> my cardiologist. Right. Kaiser contracts with them. Sure. Outside. My pain manager, you know, okay, my uh, primary center. Right. He gives me an epidural every four months. It's hit and miss. Right. And he put me on narco, you know, alleviate pain as necessary. Right. What options do I have after that? I asked my uh, pain management doctor, what other choices do I have? He said, you can have surgery. But he never delved into what kind, who would do it, or where. Then who, who said this? Your surgeon or your primary? My, uh, my pain management. Okay, so his question, I assume most people didn't hear it, is he, and I'm quoting him now, is he feels a little bit held hostage by his insurance company because they limit him to which providers he can go to. Right. Uh, and so far he's seen a pain specialist and he's seen a primary. And he wants to know if surgery is something that would work for him. Is that right? Correct. Right. So a couple things. I mean, you can, I, I would recommend you get a surgical consult, have a surgeon explain it to you. Um, because. Like, I would be terrible to explain to you how open heart surgery works. Do you know what I mean? And everybody has, I always tell people that I think you should put on the hat you were trained to put on and just stick to it. Um, and so if, you, if there's a surgery out there that'll help you, the best person that can answer that question for you is a surgeon. And they just sit down with you and hopefully, and everybody complains about how they don't get enough time with their surgeon or they have to see a PA or people don't get their questions answered, right? So what I recommend is there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of work you can do to kind of educate yourself, but that burden really shouldn't be on you. So I have put educational material so when you get that MRI report, it makes it easier for you to understand it. Uh, when the, you know, with my patients, when I recommend the surgery, I'll write it out for them and I'll tell them how to go Google it. And um, I also take the time to show them where they can see videos. But really what you need is a, you want to know if there's a surgical option. The only person that can really answer that question is a surgeon. Would I have my pain management doctor refer me? Either one. Either one, or you can just call, and then um, sometimes we get referrals. The patients call me, and so I'll call their uh, primary care physician and say, hey, your patient wants to see me. Is this okay? Um, but yeah, the only person, and I don't think it's insulting to anybody to say the only person that can really answer all your detailed questions about these surgeries, because I've walked about you know, a few thousand people through these surgeries. I know what their recovery is like. I don't have just a small you know, um, sample size of patients to draw my opinion from. So that's what I recommend. Do you think it would be wise to call like the appointment desk and say I'd like to see you get a surgeon referral? Right. Because right, and if some doctors will do it for you and some won't, and um, and then sometimes you can just call the surgeon you like and see if they can help you get that referral. Do you take Kaiser? I'm actually working on getting Kaiser. That's such a loaded question. Where's Jeannie? Hey Jeannie, how are you? <laughs> We're working our, our on our Kaiser contract right now. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm slowly coming that way. You're next, I swear to God. <laughs> and by the way, just so everybody knows, these questions aren't free. Uh, please check your, <laughs> check your uh, insurance card at the, right out there. Yeah. Right now I'm taking an opiate from my back pain. And right. It seems to help. Right. And then I think I'm going to have that ablation. Ablation done? Yeah, yep. The epidurals don't work. And I also have a neck pain. If I go like this, it makes it feel better for a minute or two. But right. the opiate doesn't seem to work on my neck. Right. I thought it would help build everything. Right. Why? But well, everybody's different. I mean, um, again, you, sometimes you have to treat these pains from different kind of, uh, if you think about pain, it's registered through different receptors in your brain, right? And so sometimes we go after nerve pain. Sometimes we go after what we call the 
body's like, we'll call it axial load, your body's weight on a joint pain. Um, there's pain specialists are really the smartest, when I, kind of going back to what I was saying to this gentleman, they're the smartest to, in terms of how to put the right, um, you know, uh, co concoctions of uh, medications together to make you feel better. Um, and say, you know, does he need more narcotics? Does he need more Neurontin? What does he need, you know, the Lyrica or the Gabapentin? These are all drugs for typically nerve pain. Morphine. Morphine. Uh, some people get, you know, reactions to the morphine, so they need to be on something else. Um, the only thing I'll say is, again, I know it sounds like a broken record, but before you go through all these medications, you might want to have someone look at you and say, is there a quick fix to this, rather than uh, a lifetime of injections and which is not, which is not, I mean, some people are healthy to have it. There's a million reasons why you should stick to what you're doing, and there might, there might be a few good reasons to tr think about another procedure. Um, the only way to do it is to have a full evaluation, and somebody sits down and says, okay, well, what are the treatments you've tried? Have you tried physical therapy? Have you tried injections? Okay, you've tried those, you're not happy. Have you tried oral medications? Yes. Let's look at your MRI. If your MRI doesn't show anything, you're gonna have to go back and try to let those doctors help you. If your MRI shows something, then you need to talk about whether you wanna consider surgery. But to get that full evaluation, just like I was saying to this gentleman, you need to sit down with someone who understands all the possibilities and works on a team and can pick up your doctor and say, hey, Dr. So-and-so, how are these injections working? Which level do you think his problem was at? I'm thinking about offering him surgery. What do you think? The ablation, yep. that doesn't last a long time, though. Well, typically what happens with an ablation is there's, there's nerve, inner, you know, the nerves come in and they feed those joints like they're supposed to, and you can feel them when the joint's getting arthritic and it hurts. And so when they ablate it a lot sometimes, and I can't quote statistics for you on this, but the, the nerve will eventually come back, and so then you'll have the pain. The best person to ask that question is the person who does the ablation, right? But if you do have a joint that somebody, like that's why I was explaining to this uh, uh, lady that sometimes it's also diagnostic. So if you get the ablation and it makes you feel great, but it wears away in three months, well then we know where the joint is that we need to fuse or fix so you don't have that back pain. Yes, ma'am. My son broke his back when he was 19, uh -huh. snowboarding, and it broke, broke it in two places, upper and lower. They uh -huh. put him in a body cast for three months, and that was it. Well, now he's 36. He's had major back surgery where he got rods and screws in his lower back, but that caused the upper back to have a problem, so they gave him a spinal implant. Uh -huh. And they put it just below the thoracic, evidently, because they couldn't go any higher, and they right. said that you, they don't do thoracic surgeries because there's new technological advances and if they do something that means they can't fix it yeah, I don't know. That sounds, uh, first of all, we do lots of thoracic surgeries. In fact, we're doing much more. In fact, thoracic surgery is kind of really the, they got the big boost in the 90s and then about a lot of people are doing much more comfortable work with that area. It's a much harder place to do your surgeries typically, but um, there's lots of surgeons that feel comfortable doing it. The implants, uh, you know, it's, it's really hard with pain, right? Because there's not like an x-ray you get and it tells you how much pain the patient is or where it comes from. There's not an MRI that answers all those questions. With pain, we're just trying to come from different angles and try to make the patients feel better. Um, but the only way to answer your question is to, again, have someone look at the MRI, look at the CT, walk him, see if there's a posture issue. Did, you know, when you operate in the lower back, you can take away some of the patient's motion, and that takes away some of their compensation. So he might have been compensating for a bad fracture up here by moving his lower back. Somebody freezes that, and now he can't compensate anymore, so it hurts a lot more. Um, so that's the kind of thought process that an evaluation can do for you. I think he's going to cut me off. I'm going to give you one more question. One more question. But it's your choice. You get to, you know, oh, no. kind of pick the right one. All right, we'll work it this way, sir. Okay, what have you read or heard about uh, stem cell use and trying to get healing of the disc? Since right. you don't have disc replacement. So, okay, that's good. Yeah. That is literally the holy grail of spine surgery, I think, because once we have it, we can fix these discs. Hopefully, we don't have people and send them through all the surgeries. Um, it's very controversial. I think if you go from an academic, like if you go to universities, um, my knowledge, no one's really, I don't know anybody, let's say there's probably somebody out there doing these things. I don't know anyone who's doing stem cell injections into the disc right now. I know there's all kinds of injections people are doing into the spine, um, but I can't tell you that there's a paper out there that says if you get the injection, it's going to make a dramatic difference. We do have disc replacement, by the way. <coughs> But you have to qualify for that. Artificial discs make you move more. So if you already have joints in the back that are arthritic and hurt, typically you don't qualify for that because that joint is going to hurt even more. And the artificial multi-level multi -level. Uh, disc replacement. 
Yeah, so our, uh, most of the time I will say that when it comes to disc replacements, first of all, just so we're clear, this is not, disc replacements and artificial discs have been around for like at least 15 to 20 to 30 years. It's not new technology. We just keep trying to make it better and see if it'll actually work. Most of us uh, stick to artificial discs in the neck. They, they work a lot better. Um, it's, uh, some people will do multi-level, like two levels. Uh, above that is, is not very common. Uh, lower back, I don't know any way that's doing artificial discs in their lower back. Now, that doesn't mean they're not doing it. You can find people doing all kinds of things. I'm not saying it's the wrong thing to do. I'm just saying in my training, in my academic background, uh, none of us have really bought into lower back artificial discs, but it is going to make a comeback. It's kind of like a, a trend that comes back every, every couple of years. How long I know, I'm sorry. I usually, I like to get my MRIs within six months before surgery, yeah. That was a short one, so you got a short one. I know there are lots of questions. We really want to be cognizant of everyone's time, and our commitment is to hold these at about an hour, so that we're at that point right now. So I'll give you a couple of you know, to-dos if you still have more questions. Um, number one, Dr. Keshavarzi's office team is out in the lobby. So you can grab pamphlets, flyers, talk to them. Um, if you're interested in seeing him, make sure to um, talk to your doctor and tell them that you'd like to come see Dr. Keshavarzi and his office team can help guide you through that whole process. So feel free to take a card, pamphlet information, call. And I don't know if you're able to stay around afterwards. Sure. But okay, so he's willing to take some questions one-on-one. -on -one. Um, please be sensitive to, to Dr. Keshavarzi's time. On behalf of all of us, thank you for coming today.